Scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to the life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of the heaven. I have been, both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. This is the word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> now, I hope that everyone is not disappointed today. There are no props associated with today's sermon. So we won't, we won't have that like we did last week. But as we look at our scripture today, we find some Greeks coming forward and wanting to see Jesus. Now this gives us an idea of how information about the great works that, had been do that he had been doing were spreading throughout the world. We know that these great works and stories would have been carried by word of mouth, most likely. Perhaps letter, but mostly by word of mouth. And it's not like they had, an e you know, had email or phones to just call up their cousins in Greece and say, hey, you need to get down here and see this guy Jesus, see what he's doing. So we find them traveling from far away to come and see Jesus. And even if they were more local, they still would have had to travel. And they find Jesus at a moment in his life here on earth that is very difficult for him. See, he again tells the people that he is going to die. Not only that he is going to die, but it is necessary for him to do so. And it is necessary for him to do so, so that great things can be accomplished. He draws the parallel for the people about a stock a week dying and spilling its seeds on the earth and growing up as more than just a singular stock that it had been in the past. He then goes on to discuss how he is troubled. He knows what is coming. He knows that he must allow it to happen in order for God's plan to be fulfilled. And God speaks to him and tells him how his name is glorified by the sacrifice that Jesus is going to undertake. So how do we begin to think about this passage in our lives today? Well, I have a question for you. When was the last time you saw Jesus? When was the last time you tried to see Jesus? You know, when Pastor Pat was leading these churches, I'm sure you may remember, if you were attending at that time, she had a question for us each and every week. And the question she would always ask us was this, where did you see Jesus this week? And I wondered, or I have to admit, that at that time, I struggled with that question most weeks. And I was always envious, in a good way, of the people of the church who seemed to always find a quick answer to that question when she would ask it. And I wondered how they were able to come up with something each and every week. 
How are they seeing the things? How are they seeing Jesus in this world when I am not? And I thought about it for quite some time. And the answer that I, find for my, I found for myself then, and I think can be helpful, ultimately turns out to be a pretty simple one. But this answer is threefold. And the first being, the first of those three being this. If you want to see Jesus in this world, then you have to be willing to look for him in this world. You see, there are so many things that are wonderful going on right now. There are so many great works and small works that are being guided by his hand. If we just stop and open our eyes and our hearts, we can see Jesus in this world. The problem for us becomes when we allow ourselves to become so bogged down in the negatives of this world and we just can't seem to find any good anymore. We allow ourselves to get a tunnel vision and focus on only the bad things that are happening. All the terrible things that we read about or we hear about on the news every single day, it leaves us filled with dread and it leaves us feeling like there is nothing good happening in this world anymore. But that is simply not the case. Now, I know that the last year has been hard. I know that it has changed the way that we do many things. And I know that some of us have lost loved ones, or some of us have struggled with the loss of a job or income, or some of us were struck down and healed but continue to fight on with the long-term recovery from this virus. And it can be very difficult to look and find Jesus in the world right now because of these things. But here is one thing that I can offer you that is positive. You are still here. Each and every person that is here today, or each and every person that may view this sermon later online, you are still here. So let us give praise to God for that simple fact. Now, besides changing the way that we view the world, how can we see Jesus? Well, we can be the reason that Jesus is seen. You see, we have the opportunity each and every day to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. We can see Jesus in this world by doing the things that he calls us and wants us to be doing. And when we do the work of Jesus in this world, we show others his love. Now, the best thing is this. When we show others the love of Jesus, and then their lives begin to change, their lives change because they are seeing Jesus now too. And they are seeing how his love can change and transform their lives. And while it feels great for us to be a part of that, we must remember that we only plant that seed. Jesus makes it grow in their hearts. But boy, do we get to see it each and every day. Each time we see them, we get to see Jesus in that person and how he is working. The third way we can see Jesus in this world is to simply... Make sure that we're seeking him. When we think about those Greeks, how far they may have traveled to see Jesus, consider when the la was the last time you made that kind of effort yourself to see Jesus. See, we have to be willing to put in the effort in seeking him if we expect to see him. After all, we are the servants to Christ, right? He is not our servant. We are his servants. Does the master seek his servants? Or do the servants seek the master? Now, one of my pet peeves is when people complain over and over and over again about something, but they are not willing to choose to make or to do anything about it to change it. And now when I say this, I mean people that are capable of doing something to change it. 
And I think we can find ourselves falling into that mindset at times. We want to see Jesus, but we don't want to look for him. So how can we expect to find what we do not seek? Now, the other thing that I think we can take away from this passage of Scripture is this. Jesus talks about the wheat dying so that it can grow up and bear much fruit. Is there something in your life today that you need to let die so that something better can grow? Now, for Jesus, it was his life on this earth. He knew that he needed to lay it down, his life, so that great things would grow up from that sacrifice. And I'm not advocating for that for you today, at least not in the literal sense, right? However, is there something in your life that you need to let die so that you can have new life? Have you been holding on to something that God has been calling you over and over again to let go of? Now for me, in this life, that was control. I held on for so long to the idea that I needed to have control over my life and whatever my job was going to be, I needed to control that. But I was wrong. <laughs> I needed to let that control die away so that the seeds of serving God could fall to the earth and begin to grow inside of me. You know, there's a wonderful song out there um, that's been on Christian radio for a while. And it's by an artist named Ryan Stevenson. And the song is called No Matter What. But in the song, there is a line that I think is perfect for us today, and it goes like this. There's never been a better time to get honest, and there's never been a better time to get clean. And this is true. See, there's never been a better time for us to make a change in our lives, the change that we need to make in order to truly serve Jesus, than this moment right here, right now. So, brothers and sisters, if there is something in your life that you need to let die, then make that commitment today. Put it into your heart and let that thing die away so that you may grow up as new stocks and begin to bear much fruit. And do this from this moment on so that Jesus' love can continue to grow or begin to grow again in your heart. My challenges for you these, this week are these. What is it that you need to change and the way you approach your life so that you can see Jesus in this world? And what is it that needs to die in your life so that new fruit can begin to grow in you? Amen.